Hey, good afternoon. Dirk Delirium here. It's been a little while, so a uh, long time no see, right? Uh, any rate, uh, I've had, I've been overwhelmed with the uh, with the amount of the responses and um, and the comments on our, our channel here. Uh, just to let you know that. I, Wow. <laughs> and uh, if you want to know what I'm talking about, just scroll through them and, and check them out yourself. But uh, so many of y'all, you know, have experienced delirium tremors or mild delirium tremors or, um, you know, delirium tremors in, in and of itself is, is, is just, it doesn't happen often. Okay. I, I think statistically, and again, I, I'm not, somebody that I don't judge my statistics any uh, way other than you judge your own and that's on doing research and finding out what you can't find. So what I've understood about it is only about uh, 3% of all real alcoholics ever uh, even go into delirium tremens, which is three out of a hundred, which is still a lot of fucking people. But you know, it's, it's not the kind of thing that, you know, plagues every household up and down the street. Alcoholism, on the other hand, alcoholism ruins families. I mean, your neighbors, your, you know, people in your town, your community. Uh, I mean, millions and millions of people are affected by alcoholism. Don't get me wrong. And it kills it, it, staggering numbers of people. Um, but delirium tremens and alcoholism are like salt to pepper, you know, so it's a whole different caliber. Okay, being said, if you don't know what the hell I'm talking about, uh, go back to the beginning and uh, watch Delirium Tremens Day 1, 2, 3, and 4. I shot them in four um, separate segments. That was the first time I ever wanted to do real Delirium Tremens. Real Delirium Tremens. Um, I had no idea what they were. I had no clue if you would have told me what they were the day before I went in them, I would have thought you're full of shit. I, I would have nodded and agreed and smiled and left that conversation right where it started. You know, wow. Guy's nuts, um, but it is, uh, it's very real. It's very terrifying. Uh, the very few real in-depth videos that I, I've even seen on YouTube and on the internet, uh, you know who's been there, you know. And you know, I know, real quick. Uh, it, because they usually start off with something like this. You're going to think I'm crazy. You're going to think I'm full of shit. You're going to think I'm making this up. All the things that I've said, you know, in and, and all these videos, it's because it's so unbelievable, you know, to, to wrap your mind around just how powerful, one, alcohol is, and two, the uh, withdrawal uh, can be for a real alcoholic. Um, now, it doesn't happen overnight. There are a lot of y'all that have experienced this at 19, 20, 21. And uh, that goes against the grain of like almost everything you read about, you know, DTs taking years and years and years uh, of alcoholism to lead up to, it doesn't, doesn't have to. Uh, and I've learned that from you guys, thank you. Um, let's see, other housekeeping issues, integrity of the information. Um, I had a doctor tell me that DTs uh, have up to a 70% um, uh, casualty. Uh, mortality rate rather so uh, out of 10 people that go into it seven out of them die okay that might not be accurate Wikipedia says 50% okay so that's one out of two um, I had some troll uh, I get a few of you here and there that you don't bother me um, but you come back and say oh, I heard it was only 40% well I don't give a fuck because that's still 40% way too high for this guy to ever want to go through again. Um, 5% is too high. Get it. Okay. This is not about how to justify delirium tremens. This is how to avoid them. <laughs> and if you've been there, what they are and uh, just know you're not crazy. So anyway, all that being said, I'm not the face of A-A-N-A-C-A-H-A. S A G A or any other A you want to tie to me. However, I do belong to most of them and have been about all their meetings, except for Gamblers Anonymous and Sex Anonymous, because uh, uh, I don't gamble well and I probably don't do sex well either. But uh, eh, it has never bothered me and it's never become a problem. So fortunately, I put that one in my back pocket. But uh, all the rest of them, yeah, if it's if it can get you addictive, uh, addicted rather, uh, my personality is naturally drawn to it. Uh, that's been true in everything from my career um, to my consumption of drugs and alcohol uh, throughout my whole life. 
if I like it, I want more of it. And I get as much of it until I, uh, I can't get any more. Uh, in the case of alcohol, I drink until I pass out, puke for both. Um, in the case of narcotics, I use them until I die. Uh, and then I have to have other people bring me back to life and all that fun. So anyway, okay, there's a whole bunch of stuff just to bring you back up to speed. Um, for those of you that are new to the channel, welcome. Um, please hit subscribe. And uh, I think there's about 55 other videos up here. And I'll make sure I start to put, uh, put one out every couple weeks. Uh, at least moving forward for the time being so you can uh, have some new material. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, obviously delirium tremens, uh, scared sober delirium tremens, the name of the site for a reason. Um, what led up to them? Okay, so what did I do that some of you cats are doing uh, or will do in the future? Uh, that are going to lead you up to it. Okay, I know what I did, and uh, I kind of mentioned it briefly. I said, "Well, you know, I got I went through a divorce. Yes, that happened. Um, I quit my job, uh, six figures, traveled all over the world. Yep, that happened. Um, and then I drank for six to seven months straight uh, without ever taking a minute off. Uh, I drank morning, noon, and night um, before I decided to cease immediately, cold turkey, stop." Um, and again, that was on uh, the advice of my, at the time, uh, a minister that, um, to no fault of his own, again, he, he didn't know what DDs were. Uh, most people don't know that alcohol withdrawal can kill you. Um, and in fact, it's one of only two that do. Uh, benzodiazepines, if you take a whole bunch of Xanax and uh, Klonopins and you know, whatever, you know, float your boat, and you do that for a whole long time, and then you quit, you can die. Uh, if you drink a whole lot and you do it for years and years and years like I did, and then you quit, you could die. Or if you mix them, it's like a double whammy. <laughs> and uh, you'll see by the comments, there's some of you out there too uh, that went into full-on DTs uh, on benzo withdrawal and alcohol withdrawal. And man, if it was, uh, I'm not going to try it. Let's just put it that way. Uh, this was bad enough. So what led up to them? I was, uh, when I went into delirium tremens the first time, um, and let's clarify what they are too. It's, it's delirium tremens is actually your central nervous system is affected by the amount of alcohol you consume, copious amounts in my case. And when you remove that from your body, your body goes into shock uh, and then begins to shut down. Um, and uh, in the course of that, um, you become very restless. Uh, you start to uh, have very um, vivid dreams. That progresses to uh, ambient auditory hallucinations where you hear things. Often it's music or talking uh, when it's not there at all. Don't go looking for it either. You won't find it. Nothing's on. Uh, but you'll hear it as sure as I'm talking to you. Uh, it is, you'll swear on, on, on your children's life that what is happening is real. Um, and then it progresses into, from the ambial auditory hallucinations to into uh, visual hallucinations. And I'm not talking about um, spiders crawling, you know, in the background, you know, and you turn and you miss it. Yeah, it might start that way. Uh, I'm talking full on solid hallucinations where I saw crowds of people. Um, I, you can view my story, I, I, I'm in depth about it. But there were hundreds of people and I'm looking at them and I'm screaming at them and I'm yelling at them and I'm a mile and a half from my apartment with no clothing on and I didn't get stopped by a cop because there wasn't anybody around. You know, it's three in the morning. How does this happen? You know, I don't, I, I didn't know. <laughs> and I know now it's, uh, it's, it's all due to delirium tremens. So those visual hallucinations are so um, powerful that the way I describe it, I don't encourage you to go out and try this by any stretch, but um, I've taken LSD, I've taken a lot of everything, and I, you know, when I was a kid, and you're tripping to trip, you know, that's the point. You know, it's kind of neat, you know, when you hallucinate, you see tracers, wee, you know, this is fun stuff. Music has color, ah, you know, this is all great, that's LSD, okay, cool, fun, mushrooms, whatever. It's like taking 20 hits of acid and not knowing you took them. That's the only accurate way I can describe delirium tremens. And they slide into your norm so uh, slowly. Uh, I mean, again, I was in them for you know five and a half days. 
uh, I wasn't hallucinating and tripping balls the whole time. I was, I was gradually led into it, you know, and then again, watch the, uh, uh, the one on episode one, two, three, and four from uh, way back in the beginning, uh, and you'll, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. I, I do break it down. So again, so that's what happens. Your body shuts down and you can die. Uh, it's uh, very probable um, if you do not have hospitalization. Um, that you will die and I did not the only hospitalization I received was uh, when I was taken there by the police and um, Not the same uh, they weren't treating me. They were uh, trying to find out what I was on. I mean, I was so you know out there uh, with these delirium tremens that uh, uh, they rightly um, assumed I was on uh, a large dose of uh, PCP um, maybe a meth psychosis or something like that. I don't know, you know, the, but they just assumed it was narcotics. And uh, oddly enough, they screen cleaned me twice. Uh, I was negative from everything, even marijuana. And uh, how, I don't know, I, I, negative on everything. They, they were so confused, they checked me twice. So anyway, um, like I said, you guys can, uh, can cruise through that. So what led up to it? Okay, um, I talked about six to seven months of solid drinking. I'll get to that. I'm gonna back up before then. I uh, give you the brief nutshell. Most of you have seen some of this before if you've seen any of the speaker meetings and shit that I have taped. Uh, Y'all know I started drinking at a very early age, around 11, and I uh, got drunk for the first time uh, right around 11, 12. Uh, 12 for sure, because um, I remember going, my lips are numb and it was funny, you know, and everything was cool. And uh, that was after uh, just a little over a quart of Michelob. Uh, and that was the first time I, I remember getting drunk and I loved it. And I went ahead and got drunk four days in a row after that. Um, I believe that was on a Tuesday. I got drunk Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Uh, the fourth day, or the fifth, I guess if you can count, uh, day one, was when I drank so much I got sick and I said I'd never do it again. And that kept me from my new discovery for about maybe two days. And then I was back at it. And then I figured I'd learn how to be sick. Uh, so anyway, I started really young. Uh, I went to military school in Missouri. I was sent to um, school for bad kids because I was starting to become a bad kid. Uh, that's not true. Uh, I wasn't a bad kid. I just abused alcohol and drugs. And um, when you're 12 and 13, um, you do stupid things and you can quickly earn the reputation of being, you know, not, not a very good kid. Uh, when in fact I, I hadn't done anything in hindsight that I, I would consider outlandish. Um, but I came from a broken home, so, uh, and I'm, none of these are excuses, by the way. I drank because I fucking loved it. I did. I found it. I had arrived. <laughs> um, so I'm not blaming anybody. It just was, when I discovered it, I'd never felt that way before and I wanted to stay that way. Uh, so I tried really, really hard, um, got sent to military school in Missouri. I drank a lot there, a lot. I learned to really drink there. Um, I drank Everclear, which was 190 proof grain alcohol and Bacardi 151 were my two uh, drugs of choice, if you will. So I drank those almost every night and, uh, didn't get caught a lot. Um, it was easy to get away with drinking because we, we all did it. Um, it was easier to get away with drinking than it was with smoking pot, uh, because, you know, pot wasn't accepted like it is today. And, uh, you can smell it a mile away. So, you know, on your clothes and your hair. Um, so, you know, the easy one was, you know, yeah, I'm just going to get drunk, you know, and then we'll smoke pot later, you know, once everybody goes to bed, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, so we did a bunch of that too. And, uh, but drinking was my thing. Uh, I got a number of nicknames when I was in military school um, related to alcohol, Bottomless Pit, Dr. B, uh, a few other ones. Dr. B was because when I couldn't get 151 or Everclear, I drank vodka. Um, and I care, I did that all the way through 26. So anyway, let's fast forward through the military school. I went to college, um, 1989, I promptly was kicked out. Uh, I was making fake IDs uh, well prior to that. I think I started making those at 16. So I always had you know, the ways and means to buy. And uh, I got one of the only four smoking rooms available on the campus of a Dutch Christian Reformed College up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, Kelvin College, very well known. 
Uh, I did my best to tarnish that reputation, and it still shines through. Uh, they just had a quick fix for me, kick them the fuck out. So they did. Uh, my roommate snarked me off. Um, my roommate, my sweet mate, snarked me off. I had a, a absurd number of empty fists of vodka stuffed into a couch, um, around 120 uh, empty bottles in a wraparound couch, and that was just from the course of like uh, not even four months. Um, they weren't all mine. But a lot of them were, most of them were. Um, one a night was, uh, so probably you know eighty or ninety of them were mine, and then the uh, remainder were those people that came in and, and drank with me. But I learned early I didn't need a lot of friends to drink with. They they were expensive, uh, unless you were bringing something, you know, you weren't worth my time. Um, what else? Let's see. So I got kicked out. Uh, I ended up getting wrapped up with my uh, first wife at right. Shortly thereafter, like six months later, her parents were thrilled. Uh, she was a high school senior dating a college dropout. Uh, she moved in with me at, when she was 17 and I was 19 by days. And uh, we married when she was 19 and I was 21 by days. And she was my drinking uh, buddy. She was the perfect piece of the equation at the time of my life where I found somebody that I enjoyed being around because that person enjoyed the same things that I did, which was uh, just getting absolutely shit-faced um, every single day. And, uh, and then, of course, you know, you're an adolescent, you know, and you throw sex into the equation and all that. We all know what we're talking about, you know. These were things that just worked out, you know, and uh, conveniently for, for someone of that age, uh, for both of us, we both got what we asked for. Uh, I think that was Harry Chapin, such a long, long time ago. <laughs> so anyway, so I married my drinking buddy. Um, she didn't take the same path I did. We stayed married for 20 years. And in the course of that, um, I built my career around drinking. Uh, I decided I wanted to be a chef because I worked in kitchens, had always worked in kitchens. And chef was everybody drank in the kitchens and the chef was allowed to drink. And he was just this demigod, you know, of, of profanity and screaming and partying and reeking of alcohol and, and, and everybody loved him, you know, or her, you know, and I, I wanted to be that person. And I did. I became that person. Uh, became one of the youngest certified executive chefs in the country um, at 29. And, uh, and I'm just over 50 now. And let's see, and I competed internationally. I got my... Um, got into that with my same obsessive, compulsive, uh, addict-driven behavior. You know, I, I couldn't have a gold medal. I, I, I had to go earn 14 of them. You know, and shit, man. If you get one of those in your life, you're, you know, it's, it's a feat, you know. But no, I was never satisfied with one. I got 88 of those damn things are hanging up on the wall behind you. But, um, yeah, you know, so, so everything kind of tied together. So, again, going back to... What led up to DTs? What I'm trying to convey here is that my life involved, revolved 100% around drinking. Nothing else mattered. If I wasn't going to be able to be drunk there, I wasn't going to be there. Um, and then, of course, a smattering of, uh, of rehab starting at uh, my first one at 17 when I wrecked a car uh, for the first time. And, um, and then I started going to rehabs through my 20s and 30s and 40s to the tune of about 44 of them total. Um, now, granted, some of those I stayed in for one day, um, some of them two days, five days. Most of them were seven-day programs, uh, the detoxes. Uh, yeah, I've done 90-day, 120-day pro programs, six-month programs. I did all that shit, too. Uh, as it progressed, but not in the beginning because, well, I wasn't going to quit. <laughs> I didn't want to go to rehab to quit drinking. I want to go to rehab to get you off my back, you know, and uh, get you to stop bitching at me, to uh, um, please a boss. Because um, I got great jobs, man. That's, you know, that's one thing about the alcoholic. And if you're watching this and you're alcoholic, you know, you know, we're, we're, we're not born like, you know, underneath a, uh, street lamp on a dimly lit alley with a bottle in a brown bag. We are some of the most focused, driven, and highly successful people I've ever met. And smart, too. Uh, I know what my IQ is, and, uh, and I'm going to share it. Um, but we're not dummies. 
and uh, we just make really bad decisions because we're addicts. That's why. So uh, anyway, so I drank on through, decided to be the chef, drank through uh, all of my twenties. The uh, pivotal point was around twenty six. Um, up until then, from my 18th birthday, which coincidentally was my first day of college, um, and I drank a pint of scotch and a six pack on my 18th birthday and uh, ran out of alcohol. And, and the following day, I bought a fifth of vodka, and I made damn sure I had a fifth of vodka every single night of my existence from that 18th birthday, day after rather, the 18th birthday, right up until literally like 26. And the only time I didn't have that was when I was uh, in a detox slash rehab um, other than that I had it and uh, and it cost five dollars and 27 cents a fifth and I'll never forget that number because I bought one every single day so then uh, 26 I started to have problems with my stomach I, you know I was I was throwing up way more than normal which was daily you know I'd throw up the first drink I had uh, back then you know then I could keep the next two down and then life was good um, I started throwing up a little bit more. I started throwing up blood, um, started to shit blood, things that aren't normal. Uh, so I thought, hmm, you know, this vodka thing is probably not working out so well for me. I think I'll quit that. And uh, lo and behold, Ice House just came out. $7.99 later, I had an 18 pack of 5.5% uh, uh, Ice House beers. So I made my transition immediately from vodka to uh, from a minimum of a fifth a night plus whatever else I drank through the course of the day to uh, 18 to 30 beers a day. And then I continued that all the way through my 30s. Um, again, only one I was uh, unable to drink. And the cool thing at that time, at least I thought it was cool, was I progressed my, my, my job status. Uh, I was corporate chef for not one but three huge companies, one was a $2.5 billion uh, company, retail company, um, 550 uh, chain retail distributor. That's what got me into the that world. Then I went into the manufacturing arena and uh, the brokerage arena. And um, I liked getting paid a lot of money and having company cars and uh, flying all over the country and never paying for a drink. These were a few of my favorite things. Um, so that happened in the course of this you know, my furthering my career um, and drinking the whole time. Uh, so I did, and and things were wildly successful. Um, I was living on a lake, uh, three sports cars, antique Porsche, um, oh shit, a company car, um, a boat, uh, a couple jet skis sold those. I mean, I had all these toys, you know, and uh, and all this stuff. And it, it, but it was never enough, you know. Oh, kayaking! I couldn't have one kayak. This is how obsessive compulsive I am. I had four. <laughs> what the? You know what the fuck? You know? You know? Yeah. Okay. Well, one of them was a two man. There's my justification. But guess what? I also had a canoe. Ah, oh, man. Okay. So I guess I had five. You know, just, 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 just wild. You know, in hindsight, you know, and uh, that was completely normal. So I drank, I used, I I got in everything I could. I said I'd never smoke crack. Oh, I sure did smoke some crack. Uh, I said I'd never shoot anything into my uh, veins. I'd never use a needle. I've used needles. Um, I've used other people's needles. I've done everything you're not supposed to do. Um, and yeah, thank God I, I've been tested many, many times for everything. I just, yeah, somebody was looking out for me because I dodged those bullets. Um, but it didn't mean I didn't um, push the envelope. And that all came with the progression of my alcoholism. So that brings me up to, let's say, 30, to, uh, let's say 39. And uh, I got, I was kicked out of my house um, by my first wife. And by the way, I'm, uh, everything happens for a reason. I'm married to an amazing woman. Uh, I'm sober, life is good, you know, but that's not what we're talking about right now. <laughs> uh, back then, she kicked me out. I believed there was no, uh, nothing good could come from this. I was, I was devastated. I, uh, I got this one bedroom apartment. I was corporate chef for a, uh, and East Coast sales manager for the largest genetic Angus beef company in the world. And, um, they 
paid for me uh, to live in a hotel for a little while and then helped me get into my uh, one bedroom apartment. And then my dumb ass just decided I was too fucked up to go to uh, Miami one day and I didn't show up for my plane. And then um, I ended up, uh, coincidentally, uh, I was let go from that job. Well, I quit actually. And, uh, and then they fired me after I quit. Uh, so you can call that what you want. I call it giving up. Alcoholics are really good at giving up, especially when we're drinking because we get what's called the buckets and we go, fuck it. I'll deal with it later. Right now. I just want to have another drink. Fuck it. Fuck that consequence. Fuck that one. I'll deal with it later. Right now. I just want to drink until I pass out. And that's what I did that morning. Uh, yeah, and that was a morning. I started drinking at like 5 in the morning, and by uh, 8 a.m. I decided I wasn't flying to Miami uh, at 9. <laughs> and, uh, and hell, the airline gave me free drinks, so what was I thinking? But anyway, I, my logic up here was I'm going to save this marriage that is already over by quitting a job that was really good because I traveled too much. Yeah, that was it. So if I didn't travel so much, I'd, I'd get this ex-wife. I, now I have a daughter who's huge part of my life and still means more than anything to me today um but you know all that was just starting and uh so anyway so here i quit this job and i'm left with this one bedroom apartment and an awful lot of money and uh an awful lot of money in the bank and then i sold my house uh with my ex-wife and that provided even more money uh, another hundred grand and uh, or 90 I guess it was whatever it was so still that was that was a lot of money 20 years ago on top of what I already had so I did what every good alcoholic only dreams of doing and I stayed fucked up I just stayed drunk man I mean I didn't know if it was three in the morning or three in the afternoon I know I've said that before I didn't I only knew when I could go out and buy alcohol and that was when I ran out and I tried desperately not to run out, but guess what? I always ran out. Every time I'd go out and buy alcohol, I would run out, despite my best measures to prevent that. You know, I'm not gonna get one 18 pack of ice house, now I'm gonna get six. And, uh, and then I'm gonna have a bottle of you know, bourbon up in the cupboard that I bought at the distillery when I toured it, when I flew to Kentucky a couple months ago, blah, 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 and I'm not gonna drink that. Well, yes, I am when I'm out of everything else. You know, and then I got a bunch of wine given to me here and there, you know, real expensive, you know, vent bottles, 82 Mondavi Reserva, blah, blah, blah. I'm never going to drink that. Oh, you bet your ass I'm going to drink it when I'm out of everything else. Um, so I did, you know, and then I'd always run out and then I'd always have to uh, either wait for 7 a.m. or uh, it would be between the hours of 7 a.m. and 2 a.m. And I could uh, freely, usually drive out and get more. Um, so I did this crazy drinking like this when I, when I quit that job, uh, it was September, uh, boy, I want to say it was like this, the 9th, 10th of September, because my, my wedding anniversary was going to be on the 19th. And that's the day I started going into DTs because I quit two, uh, three days before that I quit the 15th, 16th and started going into DTs 72 hours later. So that was on the 19th. So the last 16 days of September um, were literally just drink as much as I could pick up and guzzle. And, um, and then I tried to, uh, I contacted my minister at the time. It was a church that I had gone to loosely, um, you know, because I, I had a, a five-year-old daughter at that point. She was five when we split up and um, I had been baptized and everything. So it, I didn't go to church often, and I usually drank about six or seven beers before if I did. Um, but the minister knew me, and he knew I, you know, he knew about my alcoholism. It wasn't the first time he'd heard about it. You know, crying wife had called, crying me had called, probably I don't know, <laughs> both. Um, so we went through all that shit. So anyway, he came over and he decided that I, uh, you know, we needed to save my soul, and um, so he and another church member that came over, they like prayed for me right there with me. And, you know, and he's like, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. It's going to be the best thing that's ever happened to you. I've only saved one person before, blah, 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 blah. So I was going to be his number two and, uh, which all would have been fine. You know, I mean, I have nothing against religion, organized religion or the, uh, none the like. I didn't, 
nothing negative to say, you know, about that one way or the other. Um, but what I will say is my minister had no fucking clue what delirium tremens were, what alcohol withdrawal can lead to, and how to deal with a real alcoholic. Most people don't get it. Most people that are married to us don't get it. We're impossible, you know, to understand. We're, we're, we're horrible. Um, we're, we're the worst people in the world uh, to deal with. I, I believe that. Alcoholism makes me into uh, a monster when I put it in my body. Um, so he told me, you know, you're an alcoholic. I'm like, yeah. And he says, so quit. And I'm like, okay. So I did. And um, he was over there a lot. But why I make such a point of this is, as I started to slide into delirium tremens, and it started with, again, um, I, I, the ambulatory auditory hallucinations were, were so lucid, and it, I'd hear things that weren't there. I remember being in the grocery store uh, to buy Gatorade, you know, because I was doing all the right things, and you know, I'm gonna have a shitload of Gatorade instead of a shitload of beer, and, and I told the cashier, I'm like, the acoustics in here are really, really weird, and, she just looked at me and I'm like, yeah, sure they are. You know, she's like, oh God, are you crazy? You know, whatever. Um, but I was hearing shit, you know, you know, just weird stuff. Um, so of course I told my minister about that and he's telling me back that uh, he thinks it's the devil trying to take my soul <laughs> or keep it from him or whatever. So it, it created the perfect storm. And then as I slid deeper into delirium tremens and began to see the shadow people, um, the top hat man, um, the shrouded creature, which the, the hair is standing up on my arm, even just bringing that up, um, because it was so fucked up and frightening. Um, and if, if you don't know what I'm talking about, please. Uh, I've got a whole episode on shadow people on here. Um, they're real. and. Uh, yeah, I mean, we see them, and, uh, and the shrouded creature did not disappear, the shadow people did. Anyway, uh, all this madness is starting to happen, the insanity and the psychosis of um, the delirium tremens, and all I got back from him was, this is the devil trying to take your soul. So, naturally, I thought that was probably true, and um, what did I know? But my God, man... Uh, I'm going to end it right there because I, what I just did was I, I basically took you from the age of 11 to 40. And I said what, what I was going to do is I was going to tell you what led up to delirium tremens. And I did. That's how I drank. That's just how I drank. That's my MO. That is, there's no exaggeration there. I'm not, if anything, I'm under exaggerating. Greatly. It, it, it's... It, it's just, it, it's unbelievable what I put myself through. Um, it's unbelievable. 